Beginning with verse 1, reading down through verse 9, I hope you'll follow very carefully. Paul, an apostle, not by the will of men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me under the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present even world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that ye received, let him be accursed, or let him be damned. Now let's bow our heads for prayer. And our Heavenly Father, I want to be very clear this morning and understand and be understood completely. I pray the folk will work at listening, and may they draw no conclusions till the sermon is concluded, but may they listen very carefully. It is so difficult to balance ourselves as Christians. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. once said, the most difficult thing in the world to do is to maintain proper balance. It's true in the Christian life. It's true as a preacher of the gospel. When there's so many truths in the Bible, it's not always easy to keep the truth in its proper place and in its proper context. But a text without a context is a pretext. And I want to be honest with the Bible, and so I hope our folk to listen very carefully today. In Jesus' name... Amen. Verse 6, Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. In this verse, Paul contrasts the gospel of the grace of God with another gospel which he does not define. He simply calls it another gospel. In verse 7, he said, which is not another that sounds like a contradiction, but the two words another do not come from the same Greek word. The word another in verse 6, where he says unto another gospel, it means another different than the one we preach. Verse 7, when he said which is not another, the Greek word means another of the same kind. So that I might paraphrase it to say, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto a gospel that is not like this one, which is not like the one we preach. So there are two words another. It seems like a contradiction, but it's not. Then he goes on to say, There be some that trouble you. The implication being the preaching of the other kind of gospel troubles people, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And then he says something very strong in verse 8, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have preached unto you, let him be a cursed or let him be damned. And then he emphasizes it by saying it over again in verse 9, as we have said. So say I now again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed or let him be damned. Now I want you to get the picture here, and I want to depart from this, and you'll see why I read it. Paul said, I'm startled, I'm, I marvel, I can't believe that you have 
been removed from the gospel of the grace of Christ unto another gospel so soon. Now, the another gospel is not defined, but I'm going to define it based upon the implication of the text. The gospel of the grace of Christ is one thing. Another gospel would be any gospel that would destroy the grace of God. I mean, if you preach that a man is saved by the substitutionary death of Jesus, by trusting Christ with all of his heart, and then add some form of works to that, then you've destroyed grace in the gospel. I could not put it any better than Romans chapter 11, verse 6 puts it. And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What he's saying is it can't be grace and works. It has to be grace or works. And we have a poor concept of the idea of grace. I used to work for a loan company, and they they would give you what they call a grace period. You didn't pay your debt on time. They gave you five days grace before you got a late notice. And then we're tagged with a late charge. And they call that a grace period. That's not grace at all. That's probation. That's not grace. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved favor of God toward hell-deserving sinners without any expectation of return on the part of the sinner. And that's quite a mouthful, but I hope you got it. I don't understand why it is that you can get so confused over the doctrine of salvation. But if you ask the next ten people you see, move away from the church to ask them, ask the next ten people you see, how does a person go to heaven? You'll probably get ten different answers, even in the Bible Belt. But in the final analysis, there's only two ways to be saved, or two schemes of salvation that is put forth by man. One scheme is that man saves himself, and the other scheme is that God saves a man. Those who teach that man saves himself may say that man saves himself by reforming his life and cleaning his life up before he's saved to marriage salvation. Or they may say that man saves himself by promising to keep the Ten Commandments before he's saved. Our man saves himself by receiving the seven sacraments. Our man saves himself by obeying the gospel, whatever that means. Because there's only one definition of the gospel in the Bible, and you can't obey the gospel. The only thing you can do is believe the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, the first four verses, Paul said, I declared unto you the gospel... How that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures. How that He was buried. And how that He was raised from the dead the third day according to the Scriptures. That is the gospel. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that behaves it. That's the unauthorized translation. To everyone that believes it. The only thing you can do with the gospel is believe it. The gospel is the good news of how Jesus came to this earth. I died on a cross in your place for your sins. How that he was buried and and was raised from the dead the third day. That's the gospel. Don't confuse the truth with the gospel. The gospel is the truth, but all truth is not the gospel. It is the truth that I have on a... uh, necktie this morning, but that's not the gospel. It is the truth that I'm standing on the platform, but that's not the gospel. All truth is not the gospel, but all the gospel is the truth. You follow me? 
When I preach on hell, I don't preach the gospel. When I preach on hell, I preach a Bible truth that ought to be preached, and Jesus preached it, but I don't preach the gospel. Hell is not good news. Hell's bad news. But when I preach that Jesus loves sinners, and Jesus died on the cross in the sinner's place to pay the sinner's debt, and they buried him, and after three days God raised him from the dead as a declaration that he was the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness for the resurrection from the dead, and to show that he was satisfied with the payment Jesus made for our sins, I'm now preaching the gospel. And that's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes it. An old preacher stood before a large crowd of young preachers, and one young pastor said to him, Sir, give us a word of advice. And the old preacher said, My preacher brother, make it plain to men how they are to be saved. And you have what I call muddying the gospel. I like the waters of the grace of God to stay crystal clear. And it bothers me when people come along and throw the works of the mud of good works in the waters and muddy up the gospel of grace. It bothers me, and I almost feel like Paul to say, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach unto you any other gospel, let him be damned. You say, that'd be awful strong. Yeah, but I can quote Paul, can I? I'd say, Paul said, if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, let him go to hell. Quiet in here. And yet there's something about humanity that makes us want to add something to the gospel. We want to help God out. If we can't help Him save us, we want to help Him to keep ourselves saved after we get saved. Just like Adam, when he realized he was naked, he went out and sewed fig leaves together. He knew something was wrong, and he tried to write it. And before God made an appearance in the garden, his fig leaves were acceptable by, by Eve, and they were acceptable to himself. And they were happy with their fig leaf religion till God came. But when God came, they were embarrassed with their fig leaf religion, and they ran and hid themselves... And God killed an innocent animal, which is a picture of the substitutionary death of Jesus. And God skinned that animal and took the skins and made coats for Adam and Eve. And He didn't let them keep one single fig leaf of their own making. And you may be satisfied to stand before men with your religion. And you may say, I'm satisfied with my religion. But I want to ask you something. Are you going to still feel that way about it when you stand eyeball to eyeball with God Almighty who put His Son on a cross in your place and loaded Him down with your sin and poured His wrath out on His own Son so He, would, so he could save you from the wrath of sin, which is hell? Are you going to feel satisfied to stand before God with the fig leaf religion that you have? Stay with me. I'll probably be a little longer this morning. This is all introduction. I want to shock you, so you're going to have to stay with me. There are some that say one must give over the control of his life to Christ in order to be saved. If you do not give over the control of your life to Christ at the moment of salvation, you are not saved. Now the question is, must there be a commitment to Christ as the Lord of one's life in order to be saved? People who preach that say you cannot divorce his saviorhood from his lordhood. You can't accept him as savior without accepting him as the lord of your life also. Well, that's the question. And some make up, some people make bold statements saying that unless Jesus Christ is the lord of your life, you are not saved. But when you go to pin those fellows down and say, Has he been the Lord of your life since the day you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior up until now? Has there been a time since the moment of your salvation that he has not been the absolute sovereign Lord of your life? They will hesitate and say, Well, he's always been Lord, but there's some times I didn't obey him. 
Well, when you didn't obey Him, you were the boss, not Him. John 13, Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I command you? It's inconsistent to call Him Lord, Lord, and not do what He says. So when you really begin to question the matter, they rephrase their statement to say, Well, I'm not saying that you must absolutely make Him Lord of your life in order to be saved, but there must be a willingness to be controlled by the Lord at the time of salvation plus faith in what He did at the cross in order to be saved. And the question comes back, if there must be a willingness for Him to have the absolute control over your life at the moment of salvation, then how long a period must there be when you're willing? And how long can you wait before you're unwilling and start disobeying again? Now, it gets down to this. You're saved by grace through faith, or you're saved by grace through faith plus surrender. And I believe you're saved by grace through faith. And as good as I try to live, I'd go to hell if I wasn't saved by grace, and everybody else would too. And old Spurgeon used to say, if it should ever come to pass that sheep of God could fall away, alas, my fickle, feeble soul would fall 10,000 times a day. Now, if salvation is by grace through faith, and Paul said, I marvel that your soul soon removed from the grace of God unto another gospel. I told you the good news of God's grace, of His unmerited favor, and you've been moved to something else. And I marvel at your soul soon removed. He goes on to say, if somebody else preaches another gospel, even if it's an angel from heaven, let him be accursed, or let him be damned, or let him go to hell, is what the Bible says. Pretty strong language. If it's salvation by grace through faith, as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 declares, then it's not salvation by grace through faith plus surrender plus promises plus enduring to the end or plus anything else. It's salvation by grace through faith, period. You say, Dr. Hudson, don't you believe in surrender? Absolutely. Wholeheartedly. But not to be saved. I believe eating cornbread and butter beans, but not to be born again. I believe in sucking the bottle when you're born as a little infant baby, but not to become a baby because you are a baby and so you can grow as a baby. It all depends on where you put it, that's all. The diamond ring is a beautiful thing on your finger. As long as it's in the right place, it's... Admired, but you take it and put it down in your shoe and walk around with it, and when it gets out of place, it becomes a bad thing. You take the surrender of the life to the absolute Lordship of Christ as a beautiful and wonderful thing, and every Christian ought to be surrendered to Christ, but you put it on the other side of salvation and make it a requirement for salvation, and it becomes an dirty, ugly, dirty, wicked thing and replaces the grace of God for salvation. I want to preach a little longer this morning. I haven't been here in a while. Let me give you some Bible examples of uncommitted believers. First, I'll call your attention to some who had definite lapses from a full surrendered life after they were saved. I'll take David for one of them. David may have surrendered his life to the Lordship of Christ at the moment of his conversion, but he dead sure wasn't Lord of David's life when he went to bed with Bathsheba. David was Lord at that time. David was running the show. David may have surrendered to the Lordship of Christ at the moment of salvation. I'm not saying he did. I'm saying he may have. But Jesus Christ was not Lord when He sent Uriah out into battle and had him killed. That's murder! He wasn't Lord then. 
I'm saying David did not submit to that lordship. I'm saying his life was not committed to the absolute total control of Christ when he committed adultery and murder. So he definitely had a lapse. If total surrender was a prerequisite to salvation, did he lose his salvation until he totally surrendered again? Sure he did. If total surrender was a prerequisite, he lost it. But he didn't lose it. All he lost was the joy of his salvation in Psalm 51. I'll give you another example. Noah was saved by the grace of God. And the word grace is used in connection with the salvation of Noah. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And when the ark landed, Noah got drunk. And in a drunken stupor, he took his clothes off and he was naked. And his sons backed up to keep him looking on his nakedness and covered him up. If Noah surrendered and committed his life to the Lordship of God, when he was saved, he had a lapse. You can't say Jesus Christ was controlling his life when he got drunk. Noah was controlling his life when he got drunk. I'll give you another example. The Apostle Peter, who said, Though all men forsake thee, I'll never forsake thee. And that dirty bum... followed the enemy warmed himself by the devil's fire, and one of the enemy came by and said, Hey, that fellow there is one of them. That's, he's one of the Lord's boys. Oh, it's, I don't know Jesus. <laughs> the other one came by and said, Yeah, he's one of them. No, I, I don't know Christ. I'm not one of them. And a woman came by and said, You're one of his disciples. Your speech betrays you. And he said, You blankety blank, blank, low down, stinking moment. I don't know Jesus Christ. never knew him. Watch out, Peter. If he surrendered for the Lordship of Christ in total commitment at the moment of the conversion, he had a lapse when he cussed and said he never knew Jesus Christ. And what about John chapter 21 when he quit the ministry? He said, I go a fishing, you pay go, which is a public announcement. I never intend to preach again. I am through preaching, I quit. And six preachers went with it. When he got out there in that fishing boat, he took his clothes off. And he was out there naked in the middle of the night in a fishing boat fishing. It's all in John chapter 21. If he was surrendered to Jesus Christ totally at the moment of conversion, he was not surrendered totally to Jesus Christ now. Because he quit preaching and God had called him to preach. And God had to come and warm his backslidden heart for the fires in John 21 before he preached in Acts chapter 2 and had 3,000 converted. So I could go on all morning and give you example after example after example after example out of the Bible how many, if they were totally surrendered, had a lapse in that yieldedness or surrender or commitment after they were saved. Let me give you a second example from the Bible. I won't take time to explain it, but study Acts 19. You have the conversion of some people at Ephesus. They had been worshiping the god Diana. An important part of that worship included the superstitious dependence on magical words and charms and sayings. And turn to Acts, if you will, chapter 19. Paul had been there two years preaching. And Acts chapter 19, been there two years preaching. And these people had believed on Christ. And verse 18 says, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. You study the first part of this book, you'll find that some had believed as much as two er few years earlier. And those who had believed some as much as two years earlier, according to the context, read it for yourself. 
Verse 19 says, Many of them also which use curious, and if you look at the margin, it's magical, magical arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver, $9,300 worth of books burned. This is two years after they had trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. They're just now burning up their books of magic two years later. Here are people who were saved without, at the moment of salvation, being absolutely committed to Christ. How many of you were saved, and after you were saved, you began to quit habits? Let's see. How many of you, all right, embarrass some people. How many of you quit smoking after you got saved? Raise your hand. Put them down. How many of you quit smoking in order to get saved? Raise your hand. How many of you quit drinking after you got saved? Raise your hand. You don't get drunk anymore. Raise your hand. Put them down. How many of you quit drinking in order to get saved? Raise your hand. Not a one of you. You don't get better to get saved. You get saved to get better. You can't get better till you do get saved. You don't have anything to get better with. So here you have people in Acts 19 who were believers who had not totally committed themselves to Christ even at the moment of believing on Christ. And two years later, they burned their magic books two years later. I was saved when I was 11 years old. There are many things I never heard in that country. I didn't hear beans about separation. I knew nothing about total surrender. I knew nothing about the Spirit filled out. I knew nothing about witnessing and so on. I was saved in a primitive Baptist anti-education, anti-missions church. And I was everything but totally committed and totally surrendered. I just came to Jesus as a poor lost sinner and threw myself on Jesus Christ. That's all I did. You say you're not saved, and you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> if I'm not saved, God Almighty is the biggest liar that ever lived. If I don't have everlasting life, Jesus Christ deliberately, 99 times... And the Gospel of John deliberately deceived me about it. I have it. Yeah, they got rid of their magic books two years later, but you know why they got rid of them? Because you read Acts chapter 19, seven sons of Sebe, seven professional traveling exorcists tried to cast the demons out of a demon-possessed boy and the demon-possessed man jumped on all seven of them and beat them about half to death and left them wounded naked, and it scared the daylights out of those church members, and they decided they better clean their lives up. And they began one at a time to bring in the magic books and build a bonfire of the magic books. I'll give you a third example. A third example is the example of a lifelong refusal to commit oneself to the Lordship of Christ, that is, to allow Christ to completely be the boss and Lord and sovereign and control over his life. And his name is Lot. If you only read the Old Testament example of Lot, you wouldn't believe he was saved. You'd have to read Second Peter 2, 7 and 8 or you'd never believe it. I read it and still sometimes don't believe it. But the Bible said, Lot, that just man, J-U-S-T, just. And in verse 8 he says, That righteous man vexed his soul daily with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Twice in verse 8 he's called the righteous man, the righteous man. Verse 7 calls him the just man. But you read the Old Testament account of him and you don't see where he was ever at any time before or after salvation surrendered to God. If you think he was, you better read it again. His uncle Abraham set out on a journey and Lot just followed his uncle. The process is herd of cattle grew and his cowboys began to fight with Abraham's cowboys. They called them herdsmen back then. And they decided they better separate because their herdsmen were fighting each other and fussing over the cattle. And this little puny, potato string backbone nephew looked up at this giant of faith, Abraham. And Abraham said to Lot, you go the way you want to. And Lot looked towards the mountains, and he looked toward the well-watered plains of Jordan. 
that dirty bum, if he had surrendered, he ought to have said, Abraham, Uncle Abraham, I'm not supposed to be out here. I just followed you. You make the choice, and I'll take the one you don't want. But that little pep squeak, he took the well-watered plains of Jordan. He should have said, Uncle Abe, you take what you want. He wasn't surrendered. And he went down to Sodom, and he called the Sodomites brothers. That's not surrendered. You call somebody who doesn't believe the Bible a brother in Christ, you're not surrendered. Shows you don't know much about the Bible. The only man's your brother is a man who's received Jesus Christ as Savior. You become a son of God by faith, John 1, 12. He called those wicked sodomites, Brethren! You think he surrendered to Christ? Keep reading about it. Two angels come down from heaven, Lot takes them into his house, and the young men and old men of the city of Sodom come past the house of Lot about and clamor and cry, saying, Send those men out here that we may know them. They wanted to commit homosexuality with two angels that came from heaven. Both young enemies, that's where you get your word Sodom from, or sodomy. And you know what that surrendered, dedicated man did? No, unsurrendered, undedicated, uncommitted man did. He said, I have two daughters in here who have never known a man. I have two virgin daughters. I'll send them out and you can do what you want to with them. Does that sound like a committed Christian to you? No, it doesn't. Keep reading. Did you ever find him committed? I never did. And when God sent an angel down to him to get out of Sodom, he lingered. Didn't even want to leave. He loved it so good. He liked that wickedness and sin in Sodom. And he stayed in there loving it like a hog love slot. Hard for me to believe he is saved, but the Bible said he was. And finally the angel had to get him by the arm and drag him out of Sodom, pull the fire and brimstone rain then from heaven. He was so worldly and uncommitted and unsurrendered, his sons-in-laws laughed at him when he tried to win them to Christ. They mocked at him. <laughs> Talk about getting us saved, wanting us to flee the judgment. <laughs> they laughed at his testimony. He followed him if you think he's committed. And fine brimstone rains down from God out of heaven. And they leave Sodom and Gomorrah. And he goes out into a cave and he takes with him his wife and two daughters. And his wife looks back and turns to a pillow of salt. And he goes into a cave with his two daughters. And he got drunk in that cave. I want to ask you something. Was there a liquor store in that cave? Was there a wine shop back then in the cave? And he walked back in the back and said... Anybody home here want to buy two bottles? That was a cave. They had no liquor store in that cave. You know where that wine came from? He brought that with him out of Sodom. Didn't want to leave when he left. They had to drag him out. And he stuck a bottle of wine or something under his coat and hid it. And when they drug him out of Sodom, he got out there in a cave and got drunk in the cave. While he was drunk, he committed adultery with both of his daughters, and both of them gave birth to babies and cursed the world with two races of people. So you have three examples from the Bible. Number one example is men who trusted Christ and who had lapses in their yieldedness or surrender after they had trusted Christ. And you have example men who trusted Christ but did not surrender until at least two years later. And you have an example of a man who never did yield his life to Christ, who never was surrendered to Christ from the time he was saved until the time he died. He was never surrendered. Let me, give me a few more minutes. Not only do you have Bible examples that refute lordship salvation, but you have clear passages of Scripture. 2 Corinthians 12, 3 says, No man can cause Jesus Christ Lord except by the Holy Ghost. I get it. A fellow who does not have the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life is not a Christian. 
Romans 8 9 says, They that have not the Spirit of Christ are none of His. You listening? The Bible said in Galatians 4 6, Because you are sons, He's given you the Spirit of His Son, whereby you cry, Abba, Father. Cut that machine off of that we get through down here. You will, please. No distractions. Sometimes people have to leave the church for various reasons, so I don't like any distractions when I'm preaching. It's all quiet here now. I want you to look right at me. Go back to what I was saying. Bible passage, no man can call Jesus Christ Lord except with the Holy Ghost. And you don't have the Holy Ghost till after you're saved. You're born of the Spirit, John chapter 3. You're sealed by the Spirit, Ephesians 4.30. If you have not the Spirit, you're not a Christ, Romans 8 and 9. Galatians 4, 6, because you're sons, He's given you His Spirit. And if you can't call Him Lord without the Holy Ghost, and you must call Him Lord to get saved, and you're not saved without the Holy Ghost, you've got a problem. Philippians 2, 13 said, It is God that worketh in you both the will and to do His good pleasure. God gives the desire to do, and God supplies the power to do what He gave the desire to do. And if you had the desire and the power to do it before you got saved, you wouldn't need to be saved. Here's the book of Romans. I like Romans. Romans is a book about salvation. If I had time, I'd preach about four chapters here. Romans chapter 3 says everybody needs to be saved. It describes humanity. It lays the human being out on God's table and gives him a divine diagnosis, I guess. And he looks at man and says his, his mouth, and under his tongue is a poison of ass, his throat is like an open sepulcher, his hand shed innocent blood, his feet are swift to run to mischief. He describes man from the crown of his whole head to the sole of his feet and says man is totally depraved and a sinner. And in Romans 3 he said, There's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 packs it out and says everybody needs to be saved. And in Romans chapter 4 it gives you at least three or four ways that you can't be saved. And in Romans chapter 5 it tells you the only way to be saved. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by what? By surrender, by commitment? No. Justified by faith. Now, here are people justified by faith in Romans chapter 4. Fine. Hang with me a minute. But in chapter 12, he's talking to people who are Christians. And he says in chapter 12, verse 1 and 4, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, in view of all God's mercies, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to the world, but by, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you get that? Now, wait a minute, Paul. You mixed up, Doc, because you see, they have to have be totally surrendered before they ever get saved. So you don't call it unsurrendered crowd brothers. Paul called them brothers. We call them brothers. You mark it down. He knows whether they're brothers or not. They are born again believers, but they're uncommitted, unsurrendered believers. And Paul is pleading with them in view of all God's mercies that they give their body to God a living sacrifice. That's Christians. The, the problem is you confuse the requirements for the discipleship with the requirements for salvation. The word disciple and, and Christian are being saved is not one and the same. I always thought so. You've been always wrong. You say, where'd you get that? Out of the Bible. A disciple is a learner who sets at the feet of the teacher and absorbs the teaching and tries to incarnate the truth and imitate the teacher. But a believer is not necessarily a disciple. And a disciple is not necessarily a believer. You say, I don't believe it, all right? Give you a, give you a, I'll give you something you've got to believe it. I'll drown you. Luke chapter 6, 
Verse 13 says, Jesus called unto him his disciples, and out of them he chose twelve, whom he also called apostles, and he named them, and one of them is Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was a disciple, but he was not saved. He was a learner who followed Jesus around and listened to him and, and, and learned from him. He was a learner. He was a disciple, but he was lost, and he went to hell when he died. You can't say that. Yes, I can. John 6, verse 70. One, I've chosen twelve, and one of you is a devil. This spake he of Judas Iscariot, for he knew, knew who it was who should betray him. Judas was never saved. He wasn't saved lost. He was a devil from the beginning. Come on now. But he was the disciple according to Luke 6, verse 13. So you confuse the requirements for discipleship with the requirements of salvation. You say, but the Bible said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The Bible said, if you don't love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and hate your father and your mother and all that. You can't be his disciple. And the Bible said, if you don't forsake all you have, you can't be his disciple. Amen, 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 amen. But remember, keep saying disciple. Don't say go to heaven. That's not what God said. He said disciple. God never says come after me for salvation. He says come unto me for salvation. Come after me for service. He never said anything to the sinner except believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Give me a little time this morning. Look at Luke chapter 14, verse 16 down through 24. You have the parable of the great supper. A man builds a great supper. He invites everybody to come, sends his servants out, go and get the horn and the lame and the blood. Tell everybody to come and partake of my supper. And they said, no, no, no. That's an invitation to a gospel feast, which results, if you accept it, in feasting at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But once you have the parable of the great supper, talking about just coming to Christ, just coming and accepting what he has to offer. He begins in verse 24 or 25 and gives the parable of the building of the tower and the parable of the king going to war. And in between those th two parables, he lays down three requirements for discipleship, not salvation. And one of them is, verse 25 or 26, I don't have my Bible, I'm just quoting, but remember, you can look at it. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and his wife, and his children, and his brothers, and his sisters, and his own life, he can't be my disciple. Now they say, there it is. You say, no, wait a minute. If you're going to make that a requirement for salvation, and you're going to use that to substantiate your teaching of total commitment to Christ, our willingness at the point of salvation, then I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to take another verse. Because that verse does not say, and whosoever is not willing to hate his mother and father... But he said, whosoever does not hate his father and mother. And the next verse says, whosoever does not take his cross and follow me. It does not, who, it does not say, whosoever is not willing to take his cross. You see, when you tear down the Lordship salvation, they don't have anywhere to go, so they change it and say, but, well, it don't mean you'll always be Lord, maybe, and you won't always obey, but it means you're willing. But now they've got to find some more verses. Because it doesn't say willing, but doing. Verse 33 does not say, and whosoever does not forsake all that he has. It says, it does not say, whosoever is not willing to forsake all he has. But he says he must forsake all he has. Not being willing to do it, but doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. Not willing to do it, do it! But they say the Bible said, believe on the Lord Jesus. I should be said. Sure it did. But don't put the emphasis there. Put the emphasis on the word believe. It didn't say obey the Lord Jesus and I should be saved. It said believe on the Lord Jesus and I should be saved. Come on, talk. Say amen or go home. Paul said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I should be saved. Amen, amen, amen. Believe, believe, believe. 
not obey, behave, believe. If I'm going to jump off a building and, and, and I got a and I got a mechanic down here holding one end of the net and a doctor holding the other end and a plane pilot holding the other end of the net and a ditch digger holding the other end of the net, and I'm going to jump off the building. I'm going to trust, believe, rely, depend on them to catch me. And if I say, believe on my doctor to match to the dentist, and I should be saved, that don't mean I got to let him pull all my teeth in order to get saved. That just means I'm going to trust him to catch me in that net. Come on, talk to me. If it says, believe on, uh, on uh, Mr. So-and-so, the insurance salesman, to be saved. Well, he's an insurance salesman. He's holding a net. He's going to catch me. That doesn't mean I've got to buy my insurance for him to get saved. Come on, talk to me. It just means you're going to have to trust him to hold that net for me. Come on. Sure, Quine is more than some reason. You're not going anywhere. I'm not through. Sit down there and tack yourself down good. I'm not finished. I don't like this other gospel. I like the gospel of the clear waters, the grace of God. Don't nobody throwing mud in it. Take your dirty hands off of it, buddy. Saved by grace through faith. When we get to heaven, we're going to sing it. When you get to heaven, you're going to sing. Thou art worthy, for thou hast redeemed us. By thy blood, out of every kindred, every tongue, and every nation. You're not going to say, we are worthy. Because we have been committed and surrendered and yielded. Oh, you'll say, thou art worthy. These lordship salvation folk, if they make it to heaven, won't have anything to talk about in heaven. Because there's going to be grace up there. Oh, my soul, bless the of Jehovah. We'll sing amazing grace up there, not amazing surrender and lordship and commitment. Come on, fella. Sleep on me. Get it where it ought to be. You know what happens? Somebody come along and coins what I'm preaching, easy believism. That's easy believism. That's easy believism. And you're so scared of that word that you say, whoop, I don't want to preach easy believism. I'll put a little works in here somewhere. <laughs> don't nobody accuse me of preaching easy believism. Well, look at me right now, straight in the face. I preach easy believism. Amen. Straight in my eyeballs. I preach easy believism. Go tell the world. If you preach something else, you preach another gospel. But I'm using your expression, not mine. I said it because you said it. Because the final analysis, completely trusting Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation is not easy. That's the hardest thing a fellow ever tried to do. He wants to help God. The natural thing is to help God. The hardest thing is to put it all in God's head and totally trust Him. That's the hardest thing you ever did. Because you're called upon to believe in someone whom your eyes have never seen. You're called upon to believe in someone and you've never met an eyewitness who ever saw him. You're called upon to believe in someone whom the scholarship, so-called scholarship of the day, deny, generally speaking. You're called upon to believe in someone that died on a cross 2,000 years ago. You're called upon to believe in someone that the only record you have of him has been kept by his friends, not his enemies. That's hard to accept. That's hard to believe. But I'm going to believe anyway. You call it easy, it's hard, buddy. It's hard. And you're called upon not only to believe in his existence, but to believe that by depending on him you can be justified on the basis that he was made guilty for your sins. Shake your old peanut brain around on that. i got to believe that every sin I've ever committed and ever will commit was laid on Jesus 2,000 years ago. i got to believe that. Not only believe it, i got to trust it, depend on it. And the devil will keep coming back to you all the time saying, how you know you're trusting, how you know you're depending. It's hard to do. 
I used to argue and say, well, I know I'm believing. He said, how do you know you? I didn't have any proof of my believing. So I'd just say to the devil, I know I am for not believing. I'll start believing now. Pray it all over again. Don't. Call it easy believism. Put any label on me you want to put on me, but it's not easy to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I can get men to give money, walk church aisles. I can get men to surrender to lordship and make all kind of commitments. But it's hard to get them to stand out completely, unreservedly, wholeheartedly, and without reservation on Jesus Christ and what He did at the cross for salvation. They keep wanting to do something else. Help God out. And I have to keep putting them back on the Word and on what Jesus... Now let me help Him alone. Get back on here and stand on Jesus Christ and Him alone for your salvation. It's not easy. That's hard. But they misrepresent the people who preach like I do. They say, he just, he could. They just say that if you believe in God, you're saved. I never said that. I very seldom, if ever, say believe without stopping to say depend, rely, and trust. And I always use the illustration of the airplane. You can believe there's a plane that'll fly, but you'll never make the trip until you trust yourself to the plane. Lean on the plane. Rest on the plane. Put your physical life in the hands of a pilot you don't see, or you'll never make the trip. I never just stop and say, believe there's a God and be saved. No. Because the Bible word believe means to trust, to depend, to rely on. But it doesn't mean total commitment, absolute surrender. You'll be honest with me, there's not a one of you that could say that when you were saved, you totally committed yourself to Christ and have been absolutely surrendered since the moment you were saved. Not even the people who teach lordship salvation will say they've been totally committed. They'll say, well, he's been my Lord, but I've disobeyed him a lot since I've been saved. But when you disobeyed him, he wasn't Lord, you was. He wasn't Lord of your life. Well, he says he's always Lord. Yes, I know the word Lord comes from the Hebrew word Adonai, which means master. The several translations of the word, I know that. In that sense, he's everybody's Lord. He's the tadpole's Lord, and the bumblebee's Lord, and the bullfrog's Lord, and the rattlesnake's Lord. He's master of the whole universe. He can do what he wants to when he wants to. But when I talk about being Lord, I'm talking about you yielding for him to have the absolute control of your life, saying, where to, Jesus? Which way, Lord? I'll do anything you want. That's what I'm talking about. If you mean when you get saved, you just say, Jesus is Lord. You'll be like Matthew 7, verse 22 was. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. It's one thing to say, Lord, Lord. It's nothing to do what the Lord says. Come on. I want to help God out, don't we? You say, man, Brother Curtis, you make it too easy. I'm afraid to fool with anything, mess it up. When Jesus divides the whole world into two groups, I'll be through in a minute. Verse 18, John chapter 3, He that believeth on the Son is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not committed his life to Christ. No, 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 brother. He's condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Why is a man condemned? Because he won't trust completely the Lord Jesus Christ. You trusting your salvation, your commitment, your surrender, I hate to tell you, you're going to hell when you die. John 3, 36, Jesus divided the whole world into two groups. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. What did it say? You don't believe on Jesus Christ, you're going to hell when you die. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. Jesus said it. Mark 16, 16, He that believeth not shall be damned. Not he that believeth not and surrendereth not and is not committed, but he that believeth not shall be damned. I said this to a guy last Sunday, one week ago today. He said, but preacher, that's so easy. He said, what is the incentive for service? I said, 1 John 4, 19, we love Him. Not because we're afraid we'll lose our salvation, but because He first loved us. You love Him because He loved you. Well, what's your incentive for service? 2 Corinthians 5, 14, the love of Christ constrains me. It urges me. It compels me. It pushes me on. I love Jesus so much I can't quit. You love God like you ought to love Him. You'll serve. I don't serve because I'm afraid I might lose my salvation. 
Nor do I serve because I think I must stay totally committed and surrendered in order to be saved. I serve because I love Him and I want to serve Him, and I think any other kind of service makes God sick. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not agape love, translated charity, I am become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And though I have all faith so that I could say to yonder mountain and be plucked up and cast into the sea and have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my good to feed the poor and give my body to be burned and I'm not motivated by genuine love for Jesus Christ, it profiteth me nothing. Paul said, all service ought to be motivated by love, not fear. You know why I work? Make a living my family? Because I'm afraid. No, I'm not afraid. Not the least bit afraid. I do it because I love. The motivation of service is not fear, but love. And you preach like I preach. You're saying you make it too easy. No, you're not. You preach the other way and you muddy up the gospel of the grace of God and a poor fellow who's not saved says, well, you tell him you've got to surrender to the Lordship of Christ, you've got to be totally committed and totally yielded, or you can't be saved. And the poor fellow thinks, oh me, how can I quit that and that and the other and that and the other? He's not saved, remember. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit. He does not have the new nature which comes at the moment of conversion. All he has is an old sinful nature. You'll never convince him he can ever live what you like you want him to live. You want to lead him to Christ and get him born again by trusting Jesus and get that divine nature in him. And the life he thought he couldn't live, he now wants to live and finds power to live it. Not only that, you preach another gospel and say you have to be committed and surrendered and everything else. You know what you're doing? You're doing what Paul said they were doing. You trouble. Some have troubled you and you preached another gospel, which is contrary to the grace of God. You trouble a congregation. It is not by business to get him to try to talk every one of you out of your salvation. I study the Bible. You have confidence in me. So why I keep trying to prove to you you're not saved, 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 you're not saved. And I keep working on you. After a while I get you to doubt. And I trouble you just like they trouble the people of Galatia. But I'm not going to do it. I'm going to preach to you the pure Crystal, clear, salvation, by grace, faith. And I'm going to tell you after you're saved, if you don't behave yourself, God will take you out behind the woodshed and pull your britches down and tear you up. Based on Hebrews chapter 12. And then I'm going to tell you that after you're saved, you ought to surrender to God and be a soul winner and read your Bible and pray and go to church and be a good Christian. But I tell you, do that to get saved. I'll never win you to Christ. My little boy, before he's born, he won't be born to the world and be my son. So, you want to become Dr. Hudson's son? He's not born yet. He's way back down in Never Another Land. He said, Yeah, I want to be Dr. Hudson's son. So, okay, if you'll commit yourself and surrender to everything he says now, you can be his son. No, oh, man, just let him be born. Now that he's born, I'll make him commit and surrender. When I said, go get, the, go get the garbage boy, he hadn't always been committed. Been a couple of times he wasn't real committed. Ah. Ah. Don't take him long to get committed, though. i got a committer in my house. But he didn't get committed to become my son. He is born to become my son. And you didn't get committed to become a Christian. You were born again to become a Christian. I've got to quit. I'm not through. The one requirement for becoming God's sons found in John 1.12. Oh, we said time to quote all the verses. The Bible's full of them. As many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. But as you become a son, the Bible said, grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter 2, 2 says, Desire the sense and milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Sin. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
I marvel that you are so soon removed from him, from the gospel of the grace of God to another gospel which is not of another. Although we are an angel from heaven come unto you to preach some other gospel, let him be damned. Let's stand together. All right, I'll preach about 20, 30 minutes. No, about 20 minutes longer than usual, I guess. 25. I'm usually through about 10 after 12. I want you to be patient just a moment. We usually baptize after the Sunday morning service. Happy we're going to be baptized. I've held you longer. I don't do this as a rule, so you ought to be able to bear with me this morning. I can understand a few visitors who come in here this morning. They used to go into church, getting out at 12 o'clock sharp, starts at 11, stops at 12 o'clock, and the church gives up its dead, and out they go. But I came to do a job this morning to preach a sermon. I didn't come here to spend 20 minutes in a little sermonette to a bunch of Christianettes run out and smoke your cigarettes. And I come to preach to you. If you don't like it, you can lump it. If you don't agree with it, you can get right or die wrong. You see, it's not what Grandma believed. I'm sorry, Grandma didn't know any better. It's not a matter what Grandma believes. It's a matter what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. Lest you don't know it, you ought to be dedicated and surrendered to God, lock, stock, and barrel from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet, and you ought to be a good Christian. You ought to be. And I plead with you in view of God's mercies that you do it, same way Paul did. Same way. Boy, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the Pope for the way they listen. Help them to be patient the next few moments now in Jesus' name. Boy, heads are bowed. I'm not going to give a long invitation this morning. I'm not going to plead a long time. I'm going to plead because the sermon has not been of such that I want to give an invitation. But there's always some people here without Christ and some who need to join the church and some who need to be baptized. If you're trusting anything other than Jesus for your salvation, I hate to tell you, but you're a lost friend. You're going to hell. I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how good you live. If you're trusting anything but Jesus for your salvation, you're lost. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, you must trust him. You must trust him completely. How many of you will say to me, Dr. Hudson, I know, sir, I know, sir, that if I were to die today, I would go to heaven. Raise your hand. Let me see it. I know it. I have trusted him. I know if I die, I'll go to heaven. Put them down. How many will say to me, doctors, and I'm not sure, sir, if I die, I'll go to heaven. Please pray for me. Raise your hand. Let me see it quickly.